Professor Lee, first, let me just uh, say how grateful that we are who are working on this interview series. We're just grateful to you for agreeing to be interviewed. Um, one of the things that we have discussed or one of the things that I think is the people really appreciate about your work, uh, and my introduction will be very brief because we really want to hear from you. But one of the things people really appreciate about your work in particular is that you've written about, about women Christians in China. And you know, uh, you've written several articles related to the Mission Étrangère de Paris uh, mission, a French mission. Uh, okay. And you've, you've written not only about their archives, you've written about uh, Chinese Christians, I think from Northeast China. Yes. Um, you've written a lot of very significant uh, works. And they've become, in many ways, a standard source for us who want to think about the lives of female Christians, especially female Catholics in China. But certainly, the book that we've all, you know, cited is your book, uh, God's Little Daughters. And that is a book that uh, you published with the press that, that is actually my press also. Um, so, uh, uh, at the University of Washington. But you know, I, I want to keep my, inner, my introduction short, so let's begin. You know, we're asking all scholars the same five questions, um, okay. and we just talked about you having a screen share, so whenever you want to do the screen share, we can do that. But let me begin with the first question, which is, the, is, is the, maybe the important question, what brought you to the field of China Christianity studies? You know, what what made you interested in this field? And specifically, what, why do you research the specific topic that you research? Okay, thank you, Tony. Very nice talking to you in this time. So um, I'm Chinese. I was born and grew up in China, and I went to college in Beijing. So uh, when in my, that's in 1990s, when I went to college. So my ma I majored French history in my undergraduate study. So with all the fantastic fantasies about Paris and France, actually have never been to France at that time. I know very little uh, about French history, but I got fascinated about uh, Western civilization, Western culture. And then when I applied for the PhD program at Michigan, and I proposed a research project about comparative study of women and the revolution. So, uh, very naive but very uh, enthusiastic project. I want to, I'm interested in women. I think that's related to my personal experience as a female. And then in the, in Michigan, I took the first two years, I took a number of courses about European history, especially cultural history. And I'm especially interested in French Revolution. I think that's because I was born, I, I'm actually a post Chinese cultural revolution generation. But all my teachers in Beijing, they are that generation. So we heard about revolution a lot, but it's in a very conservative way of revolution. So our, my understanding, original understanding about revolution is all about political action, about politics. And then at Michigan, in the courses of European history, we read some books about religious origins of the French Revolution. I got the first sight, I think, what? Uh, French Revolution has something to do with Christianity or religion. So I got very enthusiastic in reading those books. And the more I read, the more I realized, okay, if I want to understand French Revolution or French history or more generally the West, I have to know more about Christianity. I have to know about Christianity. This is kind of a key term in understanding Western civilization, but I know nothing to be frank. So because I was born in a big city and uh, grew up in the in a still the atmosphere of cultural revolution. So I think that this gives me a yeah, very, um, I got very interested because I know nothing and I know it's important. So finally, I finished the coursework and I got the chance to visit France. So at that time, I know I want to find some archives to um, concerning both France and China. And so I started with uh, missionary archives. And luckily, I, I had a French professor there who introduced me to the Mission Etangere the first day I arrived in Paris. So uh, I visited the archives the first day I arrived in Paris. That's the first time in my whole life uh, being in Paris. 
So it's a beautiful 17th century seminary right there. And I met the uh, young archivist there. I told her that I'm interested in China, especially northwestern part of China. That's because my Michigan cohort, we have a big research group working on Dongbei, northeastern China. But most of my colleagues there, they work on the demography, social history, economic history, so nothing about religions. I just became curious. So if I can find, find something about Madria, about northeastern um, Catholics or Christians, perhaps I have, can have a dialogue with my colleagues in Michigan and we can understand uh, North Manchuria in, in, uh, in multiple ways, in more, uh, I can bring in more perspectives to understand in this region of China. So I started with Manchuria uh, section and the archives there and it turned out that they have a um, considerable amount of archives but not too much, not like Sichuan section, they have huge amount of archives and it's impossible for me to, to look at all of them during my PhD tenure there. So I spe I've spent the next four years working with Manchuria section, so mostly documents there. And I looked one document after another. Most documents are very standard church records. I think it's not very much different from like the documents from Sichuan, Jiangnan or other area. But we do have some very fantastic, um, very exciting discoveries and the two letters I, I talk about and a lot in my first book is a, is a very um, exciting discovery of my archive work uh, during my first visit to the archives of the Mission Metangseng. So can I share the screen of the documents so, as I talk about it? Okay, let's see. So can you see it, Tony? Just, yes, excellent. Okay, so uh, my first book, my dissertation project, it's uh, actually started with the letters and then I, uh, it transformed into a, my first book. The first book, the title is Do uh, God's Little Daughters, as you can see here. This is actually a literal translation of the original Chinese term. It's called Xiao Shen Nu. Um, maybe here, you can see here, Shen Nu or Shen Nu. So these letters, I discovered letters in the uh, afternoon. I can still remember vividly when I was looking through the church archives, the, some of the very boring statistics, and suddenly I noticed the three uh, packs of yellow rice paper folded and I unfolded and turned out the whole Chinese. So there are three letters. This is the first one. And you can see very easily here, it's Xiao Er Niu. So some, some daughter called the second daughter. So that's a very um, informal uh, term to call the daughter Xiao Er Niu. And uh, the second one daughter, uh, the second letter is written by Du Xiao Da Zi. Mm. So Xiao Da Zi is a local term in Northeastern China about the youngest. So the Du family, the youngest one. And the third, uh, and third letter is uh, Du Xiao Shi Yi, so the number 11 of the Du family. They, they don't have formal Chinese name, not like the formal Chinese name. They have number two daughter, number 11, the youngest, but they all have very, uh, they, they all have Christian names, like this one, Du Xiao Shi Yi, named Maria, mm -hmm. Du Xiao Shi Yi, Maria, Maria, and this one is Phenomen. And the letters are written to Lin Shen Fu here. We have Lin Shen Fu. So, so exciting. And when I read these letters, I realized there are a lot of questions uh, immediately coming up to my mind. Who are they? Why did they, where did they learn to read and write? Because the, in this letter, it says it's written in um, 1871, so that's still in late Qing, and these girls are from a small village in rural China. Uh, the literacy rate for women at that time uh, was very low, so where did they learn to read and write? And who are they? Who is the Lin Shen Fu? And if you read the contents, uh, so some contents are very emotional, are very private, these are the names, and 
Uh, they also mentioned a village named San Taizi. It says that some missionary priests established a convent in the village but, and I encouraged them, asked them to join the convent, but they didn't want to join them. So at least I know somewhere it's called San Taizi. And then this gives me enough clue to look into the documents, archives, and think about my project. So actually my dissertation and my first book only talks about 19th century, the early stage of, um, of the Manchuria mission. So the Manchuria mission was established in the middle of 19th century. I, I studied how the Christianity uh, was disseminated in that region. I, I started with uh, two letters and asked a number of questions and relied on the church records and other Chinese records to talk about dissemination of Christianity in this region. So that's most part of the uh, first book and I argued that the, they, the because of dissimulation of Christianity to local society, they provides new opportunity for these rural women, Chinese women, um, what I call is a lit a religious literacy. They, they provided them a kind of literacy different from the traditional Chinese literacy that's basically based on the Confucian classics. So the church uh, they opened a new world for these rural women, even though they not systematically learn to read and write. They learn to read and write because uh, by memorizing the catechism and other teach church teachings. So this kind of religious uh, literacy opened up a new world for us to understand uh, women's literacy, women's awareness of self, women's construction of subjectivity. So a lot of topics in women's history in China and also in relation to Christianity, missionary and religion in general. So this is a first project. But after my, I finished the whole project, I got still very interested in this place called San Taizi and the two women. So I started my field work um, after I got a job in Hong Kong, after I came back to Hong Kong, but still it's very hard. The, uh, the first time I visited San Taizi was back to 2007 and I was still in the final stage of my dissertation writing. So I asked a lot of local friends in Shenyang, the capital city of Liaoning province. Most of them never heard of the village named San Heights. And uh, even in the local maps, you cannot locate it. So uh, one of my friends uh, decided to drive me there. And we, we just drove around the region. And we know the, it's about 70 uh, kilo meters south of Shenyang. And finally, when our car was driving uh, through the paddy field, rice fields, I, we saw a, a cross atop the church emerging from the horizon. That's a very exciting moment. And we finally found Sun Heights. And uh, at that time, we didn't prepare anything. Right, right now, if you want to do some serious field work, you need to go through some process uh, in China, especially in this old Chinese Catholics. But my first trip was eye-opening. I know San Taizi was real, is still real. So after I, I start working in Hong Kong, I'm still working on trying to look at the Xianzhi, the local gazetteers, all the clues, try to find the Du family and San Taizi. So this is another uh, very uh, great story about how I got contact, finally found the Du descendants. So one day I just uh, searching on the internet, um, looking for something about the uh, San Taizi and Du family. And suddenly the search engine took me into a Chinese genealogy website. Mm -hmm. So the website, there is a guy, a young man called Du Huai Sheng, who po had posted an uh, advertisement or, or note there saying that we are a Du family of San Taizi in Liaoning province. We are from Shandong. Lai, Lai Zhou. So we are looking for the, our family members or, or other clans of our originated son of Sandu, of Santai's Du family. So he posted that. I saw it and he left a phone number. I just called. That's in 2010, 2010, when I was in Hong Kong, just started my job in Hong Kong. So I made a phone call and he picked up the phone call. <laughs> it turned out he's just a few years younger than me. So we, after our phone conversation, I, I thought, okay, this is a new opportunity. I should go there. And the next year, next summer, I went to Sanhai. I went to 
uh, Dongbei, and for the first time I met um, Du Huaisheng. So in the epilogue of my uh, first book, I wrote about that this piece of story. So I showed him the two letters. See, see, this is what your two family, your, your ancestors wrote. And he got very excited. And he introduced me to many family members. So uh, I may have some, oh, I may have some pictures of the two, oh, yeah. Here, this is Du Huai Sheng, and this is the San Tai's church, uh, which appeared in my archives <laughs> so frequently. And there is a, a stone stack still there. It's, it's basically it's destroyed, so they put back, but we cannot see clearly the characters there. This uh, still was erected after the boxers' attack of the uh, village church, so a year after that. Um, so the boxers and other Chinese soldiers uh, besieged the village church and attacked it for uh, about 20 days. Mm -hmm. And the two French missionaries and the Catholic um, villagers, they organized and fought back. And finally, St. Hesse Church at that time, uh, you can see the original St. Hesse Church here, and uh, survived. It became one of the two churches survived during the boxers' attack. Uh, in the whole Manchuria. So there are a lot of uh, very interesting stories and um, some of the pictures of my field work in Santa the village in two family. And this is one family, another one. And they are all dudes <laughs> <They> look like, <laughs> look alike, uh, uh, like very similar to each other, different generations. And this old lady uh, who is a Catholic nun and who is in Taiwan right now, she is the older eldest sister of this young lady. Uh, of this, <laughs> this is the youngest sister of Duke the Lang. So her name is Du Fengzhi. She joined a convent in Shenyang, the capital city, in the year 1948. And because uh, her parents uh, negotiated a marriage and she didn't want to get married at that time, so very naturally the, the young girl decided to join the convent. But a few months after she relocated in Shenyang, uh, the Chinese Communist uh, Liberation Army took over Shenyang. So the, the whole convent led by the French uh, missionary priests, they uh, left Shenyang. They fled actually out of Manchuria and then from Shandong, they got on a boat and ship and then finally landed in Taiwan. So right now I interviewed her a uh, few years ago in Taichung. Uh, in a um, in a convent there, so we had a lot of uh, very interesting and exciting conversations, and she shared a lot of stories about the uh, French priests and the early uh, early earlier days of her village life. So this is quite exciting, and <laughs> but more exciting the archive discoveries uh, are coming. So um, after all this. Uh, field work, uh, I, I suddenly remember because I, during my PhD dissertation, I collected a lot of archives uh, documents from the Mission Etangere, uh, and I only used a portion of it for the dissertation project, the first book. I remember that there is a collection, it's a missionary's language study notes. I, I collected uh, during my um, dissertation research, but at the time, I had no idea what's the what's the yeah that's what's the language what the study notes about so um this is a page of the study notes uh they are in my archives for quite a long time and it's called document uh the baklish noir speaking chinese souvenir of sandhai so it's about sandhai but i don't understand what <laughs> the language is apparently it's not the pinyin and it's not french and I tried to understand what it is at that time, so quite a few years ago, but I, I did not know. And after I um, so much field work about St. Heights and Du family, I think I need to go back to these conversations. And it took me a long time to decipher these conversations. And finally, it turned out these are the conversations of local dialect, the French romanization of the local dialect of St. Heights. So for example, the first conversation is about, about uh, the husband said something and then the, the, la femme, the wife answered. So there are a lot of 
after I that all together 13 volumes notebooks and over 2000 conversations so all numbered and the contents are extremely private about the quarrels between a husband and wife about uh, some quarrels conflicts between the in-laws uh, and about the uh, uh, pra get pregnant the the gifts um, for the when the baby uh, is one month old so a lot of very trivial daily life and you can still there's some some uh, uh, interesting ones maybe this one uh, the example three uh, if you know oh, right. uh, yeah if you study the conversation you know the rules uh, of this uh, of the writing rules you can decipher it so basically it's about the three old school said uh, mom uh, uh, dad mom did not give me milk dad says so what do you want me to do mom said can you show me a sign of cross and chant the catechism so that i can give you milk <laughs> so a lot of uh, things like this and some interesting conversations about christian and non-christians and this example is about some buddhist and christian um, villagers they had a talk about uh, the nominal of father and because for the survival it's, it seems that this may so fascinating for me when we talk about catechism when we talk about the catholic doctrines and we're talking about the canon the teachings and in reality what happened between these chinese catholics how Oh, for my two letters, I also discussed how did the Chinese Catholics internalize the, the Christian ideas, doctrines. And here, uh, th these are all other examples sh uh, uh, pushing us to ask the questions, what does Christianity mean to ordinary people in grassroots society? I think that's what I really uh, interested. I, I want to know more about this. I think this is also, um, a uh, challenge for me because of my background, because uh, I, I I still um, read a lot about the, the Chinese scholarship. So for a long time, the Chinese scholarship, we have a very conservative interpretation framework uh, about Christianity in China. So if you want to go beyond or challenge these conventional frameworks, for example, imperialism, colonialism, cultural, uh, invasion. If you want to challenge this, you need some substantial documents, archives, or studies to see. And I also, uh, the more I read uh, my archives, the more field work I did, the more I realized that um, Christianity in China right now is still a, rel a relatively a marginal topic in the whole field of Chinese history. So, um, but the, and the missionaries and the Chinese Catholics are still very marginal. And this is a new book manuscript I'm, I'm writing right now. I, I sincerely feel that we, we need to know more about these neglected people, uh, French missionaries and Chinese Catholics alike. So I, when I study these conversations, I, uh, I finally I confirmed the author is another a French missionary named Gao De, his Chinese name, he arrived in China, Manchuria, right before the boxers attack. And uh, he stayed, worked in Santai's village for 27 years until 1927. And then he was assigned to another, um, uh, another county. And until the 1948, he was murdered there. So a lot of stories there. Uh, it's a blessing that uh, the, the, uh, the priest Gauder, he is a writer. He kept, uh, he left us more than 700 family letters written to his parents and siblings, uh, including like about more than 200 letters written exactly in the Santai San village. So, so this is one copy of his letters. And uh, he drew this is after the ruins of the Santai church. And this is uh, from one of his family letters, uh, illustrating the village scene of the 
church, the people farming and the kids working. We can see the church and the, the, uh, the school, Catholic school there. So a lot of very interesting illustrations. This is the ruins of the village church after the boxers attack and some boxers weapons and uh, the flag memorizing the, the success a battle against the box, boxers in the village and some young villagers. So it's fascinating um, working on this. And he also drew uh, portraits of other fellow missionaries there. I don't have a uh, portrait uh, illustrations here. So, but however, I checked, I'll go back to Mission Ekanje archives. I searched, uh, input the names of those missionaries. And in most cases, you only get a few lines. So born, birth year, death year, and the mission they are assigned, and no, no more else. We know nothing about those missionaries, including this, this priest, Gaude. So I got all these letters also from Mission Etonsrech. But for in the church records, you know nothing. You know nothing about his background, or there are only few lines about this professor, uh, this priest. And so, uh, a group of uh, unknown missionaries in China and uh, numerous very marginal Chinese Catholics. And what, what can I do for them? And I feel very grateful for writers like Du Women and uh, Gu Pierre, the priest God, they left us so many precious writings and help us to go back to the past to really understand what happened between people. So when we talk about Christian in China, you talk about the missions, the church, of course, that's important, but there are a lot of things going there. And for most Chinese ordinary people in the countryside, so what does West mean? So these missionaries, perhaps they are the first foreigners. They have everything for these ordinary Chinese. They they are the they um, they are the rep rep represents of the West to these ordinary people to grassroots Chinese society, not just to the canon, the Christian doctrines, or the Bible or the rituals. They also bring they are at the forefront of the of the uh, Western and Chinese encounters. These missionaries and these pe these ordinary people. I think the the grand question in our field is what did or what does China, what did Christianity bring to Chinese society? So to answer this question, and we need to go into the grassroots society. We need to know more about what happened or how the ordinary Chinese understand Christianity. And they are very specific, they are very trivial. They are embedded in the daily life. So I think this is what I want to do with my archives. And this is kind of my mission for myself. I write for the marginal. I write for the forgotten people in history. And the marginal the French, these ordinary missionaries alike and the Chinese Catholics alike. They are like Gao De or his colleagues. They are 19th century Catholic missionaries. They are not as prominent as Matteo Ricci or the first generation um, Catholic missionaries in China. They, all, uh, they are very well educated. They left, uh, they had contact with the Chinese elites, the courts. So for this 19th century ordinary, mostly nameless <laughs> or forgotten missionaries, how, how should we do? We cannot find much information about, about them in both French archives and Chinese archives. So I think uh, no, I'm very lucky to get to know this uh, missionary and his writings. So what I am doing right now is to trying to tell the story of this missionary and his converts to to the to more readers, to colleagues, to to the general public. But also, I want to want to what I want to do right now is I think mm, I, I really want to uh, write for them and. I also want to make them known. And um, in, in the ch historical narrative in the field of Chinese history. So when we talk when we, for as a scholar in Chinese history, Christianity is a 
marginal topic. And these missionaries uh, and Catholics, they are marginal in the narrative of Christianity in China. So I think this is what I want to do right now is to write for, uh, write, write for these marginal people, these forgotten people in history, and to try, and try my best to, to bring them back to the historical narrative. Mm -hmm. Right. Talk too much. <laughs> that is a marvelous. That is a marvelous answer to that question. And one of the things that really strikes me, G, is that uh, in in this project, uh, you, you know, you mentioned that you you began this work without really knowing uh, Christianity. You had a, a lot to learn uh, church terms, right. not only in Zhongwen, but you had right. to learn church right. terms sur les langues françaises. So you have to learn a, a huge vocabulary. Right. Um, so what, what a great, great project. You know, I wonder if, if you know, so, and by the way, I think the um, screen sharing was very helpful in making those points. I really like seeing the Du family images. They just look like a very happy village. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. In a sense, they're happy with their current life. Right. Well, you know, I just wanted them to ask is, is, was there ever a moment, and maybe you already answered this question, was there ever a moment in your research that completely changed your mind about the topic? You know, you mentioned that uh, there are these certain hermeneutics, these certain ways of interpreting the, the mission enterprise in China as imperialist or colonialist. Um, uh, but then you, you start, when you see the daily lives, the grassroots, as you put it, you start to see things a little bit differently. Is there anything in your research that changed your mind in a radical way about uh, this, this topic? So um, there are a lot of moments like that. But the very first one uh, is about my first visit to the village. So as I told you just now, we, it took us a long time to find this village. So we, we went there, a group of us, I think three or four, they are all from Xinyang. So for this, uh, it's only about 70, more than 74 kilometers. This village is located 74 kilometers from the, the capital, provincial capital city. It's not very far away, it's not in a very remote uh, village, but still the, people, the villagers would think people from Xinyang, they are, they are so different, they're from big cities. So uh, because we, we went there we, without any like um, preparation, for example, to find the, the local villager cutters, so we just go, went there. And then there is an old lady who uh, lived just outside of the church wall. So she walked out, uh, seeing us there, asking us if you are from Xinyang. We say, yes, we want to see the very interest in the church. So she opened the door. And I don't know why uh, it's uh, she. And uh, she's just someone who who gets some money paid by the church at that time to take care of the the door or take care of the church. But in the day, the most times, um, unless the festival days, so it's knocked, nobody there. So she opened the church, opened the door, and toured us inside that. And I began to chat um, with her. And I asked her if she knew anyone named Du or from Du family in the village. She said, yes, of course. Yeah, Du is one of the biggest family in our village. In those family years, the Du family always opened their door and distributed porridge, rice. And she, and she also said that she, she was an orphan and she grew up in an orphanage run by this church and she still remembered the name of the last French missionary in that village she called the Fei Shen Fu. So actually the Fei Shen Fu who is one of the last French missionaries in Manchuria in Mission Tanger's mission in Manchuria and she is uh, and he finally uh, relocated to Taiwan and became a prominent uh, missionary in Taiwan. So um that's a very, very moment, you know. And when she talked about the fish and food, she talked about how nice he was and how kind he was. So that's a moment, I think, it's because in the past, all the stories I read are from archives. So they are, it seems like these are from the past. They're about the, the old days, nothing to do with our life today. It's so different, China has changed so i mean dramatically by the moment 
I see someone they are talking about the past and it's part of her personal life. So I think that moment maybe it's normal for, for others, but for me, it's the totally, um, I think it's eye opening. And I realized um, for a long time as a history student from, from college, for a long time, um, we just think that we are, we are talking about the past, nothing. It, it, it's very hard for us to find the connection between the documents, the archives you read to your own personal feelings, emotions. By the moment, I think I find the link and it's so strong in the feelings, emotions, I think. So even though I know nothing at the moment uh, about the village, about the family, about those individual missionaries, but I know they are so real and they are well remembered. And in China, you know, right now, when I look, in, when I look back to my research, the trajectory, the experiences, I think that um, for a lot of the Chinese Catholic families, um, when we talk about the story of their survival, it's all the very sad stories. Of course, it's sad because they, they, they were persecuted, they suffered a lot, but there, there are other moments. I think for two family, I think I wrote that sentence in my first book, the epilogue, that for them, this is not just, um, it, it's also part of their family tradition. So, and this is also very particular for Manchuria because it's an immigrant society. Two family is also immigrants from Shandong. So this, this uh, the, the kinship, the, the lineage, the understanding of that in these villages are different from perhaps their ancestor or original hometown in Shandong. So they, they are all immigrants from in this lo locality and they established their family, established their community and faith played an important role in this. So when, when they talk about Christianity or we are Catholics, they, they think they are part of their family history. And this family history, it's kind of, it's, uh, they made it. So, and I, the process of the establishing church there and the work, the, the daily contact with the missionaries and the immigrants struggling to settle down there, all these process, they work together to kind of make Christianity part of their family history, their personal life. So I think this is a little bit different from other conversion stories we talk about in other parts of China. So I think that, that old ladies' conversations and the, um, the very nice memory of the past, uh, I think it's a very special moment that uh, telling me it's, there are other stories. There are a lot of other stories about Chinese Catholics, missionaries, and Christianity in China and that I haven't read yet um, by in, in the archives or in the in other scholarly studies. You know, one thing that strikes me about your particular topic is that when I teach my class on the history of Christianity in China, we study Nan Huai Ren or Li Ma Dou, and and there are no photograph, and, <laughs> and no, no one has ever met them, you know, in person. But what you do, you go to the village, you meet at San Taizhe, and you meet the people who met, you know, Fei Shen Fu. So it's yeah. also very wonderful. My students, when they see, when they read about Matteo Ricci, they think it's fun. But when yeah. they finally see a photograph yeah. of someone they're studying, it becomes more real to them. Right. right? And then the second thing that you mentioned that really strikes me about this village is um, in most of the world, if you ask someone, are you Catholic or are you Christian? They say yes. But in China, places like um, maybe this village, they say, <laughs> you know, I'm the fifth generation and it's yeah. very different. Nobody any place else that I know of will say I'm the fifth generation Catholic. Right. Right. And so you do have this sense of family history and continuity. Right. Yeah. Well, let's move to the next question then. And maybe you've answered this one, too. And that is, um, it was there. I mean, you've already talked about really meaningful experiences that you've had. Is there another particular experience that you've had conducting research uh, in China that you think was was particularly moving to you? Mm, uh, I would say still the about Santa and the Catholics yeah. here. So actually, um, uh, maybe there's one um, who, there is 
one, what I should say, he is a Catholic there, but uh, he's not part of the Du family, just uh, a local Catholic. I, I almost forgot how I, I got to know him, but he, is, he worked for the Shenyang Catholic Church, and he is very enthusiastic in writing the Catholic history of Shenyang. So, you know, he's kind of what we, in Chinese, we say the Minjian Shi Xue Jia. So he's just a, a Catholic convert. And he's very interested in reading, looking for the archives. So perhaps from the two family, one of the two family members, I got to know this guy. And we became very good friends right now. And we shared a lot of information, had a lot of conversations. And he converted to to Catholic to Christianity and decided to become Catholic converts at the age of 14 and after a lot of reading. So this is also quite uh, surprising to me because for Chinese Catholics, most of them are born into Catholic families. So they are, this is kind of uh, perhaps a family tradition or from the childhood, uh, they follow their parents, grandparents. But these uh, men who, who just just converted by reading and he shared a lot of things with me and also we visited sometimes later together and he is very curious about the past and also he is very critical about the current generation about the current situation and he shared a lot of sad stories here but still he is very mm, he he's still very faithful and he's he want to do something to to not just contributing to the church, but also to the historical study of the church. So I think um, I think he is quite representative in a way of a world we don't know. So because of the right now the pressure of the um, because of the very sensitive situation in China, most Catholics, um, old Catholics like sometimes the Du family, they can still claim that openly say we are Catholics because it's relatively safe. And for the, for the other people, most of them, they don't want to disclose their, their Catholic identity. That's very understandable. And especially you want to move up, get some promotion in your workforce. So it's very hard to, to claim you are, you are Catholic. But we still have that group of people. They, they are very faithful and they are very enthusiastic in academic studies. So he said that he got to know me by like searching Fan Qiang, jumping over the internet wall and got a copy of my dissertation, but he cannot read English. So he used translate some apps to translate my, my, uh, uh, my dissertation. So um, I think for academia, for scholars, you know, sometimes, of course, a lot, a lot of scholars, they kind of, they don't want to talk to these people and they don't they had a kind of arrogance as we are well trained highly educated but actually in my in this particular field i think we need to listen to them because they are they are cats they are, they are believers they are catholics they they this faith and their understanding about christianity is part of their personal ex experience personal life and for us even though i'm non-catholic but I think this is, I still respect and I, I feel, I understand them. And I, I, they can feel my understanding. So that's why they are open, even though I'm not Catholic, part of their, part of them in a sense, but they're still quite open to me. I think, uh, as I said, that I always care about these marginal people and for them, no one cares about them. And of course they can do something for the church and, but no like scholars would, they, and they cannot find the academic work, the academic, uh, academic word for them. So there is someone who 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 can listen to them, who is willing to listen to them. And I think for me, this is a, as you said, that what I'm not a, a Christian, but still I've been working on this topic for so many years. And I think all these experiences during my research and field work are very enlightening. So. Perhaps it's not enlightening that I can convert finally, but it's enlightening as an intellectual. So as an intellectual, you should always keep open-minded, open your heart to these marginal people. And they are part, because I'm a historian and I want to, I care about grassroots Chinese society. 
and I care about margin, marginal people. So I have to listen to them. And so all these, I mean, these details, these, these trivial <laughs> moments that help me to further understand my mission. But I'm still working, I'm still figuring out uh, the mission of my uh, intellectual journey. But still, I think uh, gradually, these moments uh, can help me build up uh, my understanding about my career, about my intellectual journey. You know, it, one of the things my students like to say is, uh, after reading about Ricci, and they like it, but they think I, I'm. They say, "Oh, I've read too much about the liter the intellectuals. I've I've read too much about the emperor. I want to hear about the the regular people in the villages." which is what your book does and your research does. So, you know, th there is a great, a great need for discussing these, these marginal people. Well, we have two more questions. And this next question is one, obviously we want to hear about, about you the most, but we're asking everyone if they have a particular memory of another scholar in our field of China Christianity studies. Is there, do you have a memory about another scholar that you think is important for those of us who are in the field to remember? Mm, yeah, I do. Yeah, I have a lot to share. But uh, when I saw this question, I think I, uh, I have to choose one. And then I would say it's Dr. Wu Xiaoxing, especially for Chinese scholars. I'm sure if you ask other, especially young generation in this field, most of them would uh, say it's Dr. Wu Xiaoxi. Why I say this? I didn't know uh, Dr. Wu for, before uh, 2012. So at that time, I was just a few years, just graduated from graduate school, and I haven't published my first book. And, but I, have, uh, I didn't know him. But he organized a conference about Christianity in Northeastern China, uh, in Changchun, the Northeastern Normal University. And he invited me, he sent me the a formal invitation letter, invited me to give, to become one of the keynote speakers. So most other participants, they have only 20 minutes to share the research. And he invited me to share my whole project for whole two hours. But at that time, you know, as I have been away from China for almost 10 years at that time, and I didn't publish my first book, although I have um, one or two articles. and. Basically, I'm a nobody there, a young, fresh PhD. So I was very surprised. And I don't know where he got to find me. <laughs> and, but I think he's very generous, and especially for younger um, scholars. And he later, I asked him. So he said that because I, I searched, and you just finished a dissertation about uh, Catholicism, uh, about Christianity in China, this is no one else at that during that time and working on that so he decided to give me the opportunity so i feel he's such a generous and i can see his generosity commitment and vision of the field so later on i know he he actually organized a series of conference not in beijing not in shanghai but in changchun in lanzhou so in those very relatively remote regions of China, so or marginal regions. And later on, there is a young, even younger than me, another young student. I first time met her, she was a master's student in Nanzhou. And right now she recently got her PhD from, from Leighton. So uh, she's another example that uh, the first time she got to know the field of uh, Christian in China and participate in international conference that's organized by Dr. Wu Xiaoxin. So I think it's, I think this maybe he didn't realize it, but for the even younger generation and for my generation, we we feel so grateful. And for me, he is the one who brought me back into the Chan, Chinese um, academia in this field and introduced me in that conference. I get to know the Chinese scholars working on the topic. So I th right now, I, I also have my graduate own students, graduate students. So I and, and also I, I began to write rec uh, recommendation letters for those younger students and even the younger PhD graduates. So I think I just carry on this. This is uh, our field. And two, three years ago, 2017, in Hong Kong, we organized a conference about Mission uh, Etang and China. So four organizers, me, and another 
a young Chinese scholar from mainland China, and uh, um, father um, uh, from the uh, the other priests from the Mission Etrangere, and then the Louis Ha, uh, Father Louis Ha in Hong Kong. So that's the first time uh, I'm kind of like overseas Chinese scholar and a mainland Chinese scholar, church scholar, and local Hong Kong scholar. So and we. This is the first time we organize a conference like that. So I think what, what during the whole process preparing for the conference, I feel that uh, it brings me back the, the the happy memories about Dr. Wu Xiaoxing and the work she has been doing. I know it's not very easy, especially you want to do with the Chinese uh, academia and in that uh, situation. But she did. But he did. And right now we are the younger generation, we are carrying this on and working on this and trying to include more like young students uh, into this field. So I think this, uh, we, we are a small field and uh, this small field, it's so, I mean, it's small, but I think that we can see the mutual help, the, the mutual support all along the way. So th this year, the AAS, Joseph Ho and I, we organized a conference, uh, a panel, but unfortunately we didn't meet. But I can see that he is quite active too, the, 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 young, um, the younger generation in this field. So, and Melissa too, we are, we are also very good friends. So uh, I think uh, this is what I, I feel most grateful and appreciate for our cohort. And it's so important that we work together, we support each other, and also you and Tony and doing this series. I think it's very important for, for our field to, to grow and to develop and to look for the future, what we can do for this, our topic, our field, and the general field of Chinese history. This is a really good point to ask you the last question. I should say, uh, uh, you will be happy to know that uh, Dr. Wu Xiaoxin is the very first person in the series uh, who we interview. And, you know, he, just like you and just like me, I think, um, right? I think we all need to work together. And that's so important. Our work is better when we work with other people. But, um, well, you know, let me just ask the, the final question because it looks like we have just about four or five minutes left. Could, could you say something about, and you know, the reason I'm asking this question is many of the young scholars that you talk about, they ask me, can you, the, the people who've already published their book, ask them what they hope, what their hopes are for the future. So I wonder if you could say something about what you hope for the future of our field. Our field, I think, uh, first of all, for me, I would like to write for the marginal. I already said that. So the marginal people, um, uh, um, the marginal people and the marginal groups in Chinese society. And I think this is so important to, 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 talk, to speak for those uh, voiceless in historical narrative. And for our field, as I uh, also said that, Christianity in China is still a relatively marginal field in the field of Chinese history. So what we are doing right now, I think, but, but I think our field is actually an integral part of Chinese history and one of the most important part, especially from in the late period and modern China, because the West and China, or how can we understand China as part of the global history, that's one of the major concerns for modern Chinese history. And the missionaries, Christianity is, is the most, one of the most important uh, topics in this, uh, in this field. So as a, as a cohort, uh, as a whole, I think our field, perhaps what we are doing right now is to trying to make our field more um, exposed or more inclusive into the uh, general modern Chinese history and uh, make us um, let uh, people know more about this field and the important, uh, though they are not elites or the top people know this, grassroots people and grassroots society and make them an integral part of our historical narrative of Chinese history. 
This is a great, a great answer and a great hope. Um, well, let me end by just uh, saying that, uh, you know, on a personal note, I, I really have personally benefited from your research and your work. And uh, I want to tell you that, uh, and I've said this to a few other scholars, but uh, this is not my office. I'm, I'm, I'm in Oregon now, sort of on retreat, but at, at home in my office, your book is right here. <laughs> so, so it's just nice to you know be able to say in person that I'm so grateful to you and your work, and I look forward to adding the next book and the book after that, so thank that you. I can read them. But but um, gee, thank you so much. What a delight it was to chat with you, and um, we wish you a shanti jian kang at this yeah. moment, and we hope that you have a very wonderful uh, summer. But thank you so much. Thank you, Tony, for this wonderful conversation and this wonderful opportunity to bring together all the colleagues in our field. Thank you. It's very meaningful.